I'm Peter Bergen at, at the New America Foundation, and uh, it's a lot of pleasure to introduce Misha Glenny, who, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, more or less defined the story of uh, the Balkans in the 90s with the fall of Yugoslavia and other, and other books, and uh, <clears throat> has come out with a book that I was planning to write, but now I don't have to write since he's already written it. Uh, <laughs> A journey through, McMafia, A Journey Through the Criminal Underworld, which uh, was reviewed favorably by The Times, The Post, The New York Review of Books, The Economist, and, and many others. Uh, Misha's going to uh, make, a, make a presentation. We'll open it for Q&A. The copies of the books for sale outside, as you know, and uh, I'm sure he'll be willing to autograph them later. And thank you for coming, and thank you, Misha, for doing this. Uh, Peter, thank you very much, and thank you to the New American Foundation for uh, inviting me here. I'm very pleased to be here. I actually did quite a lot of research for this book uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., um, uh, largely because the uh, American um, law enforcement establishment is actually more helpful to journalists than the British law enforcement establishment, I I have to say, I, I accept certain operatives out in the field uh, from the United Kingdom who were, uh, who were very helpful. But I did get a lot of insight here in Washington. So I'm always uh, pleased to be back here. What I'm going to do is just explain to you how this book came about um, uh, relatively briefly, telling, uh, telling you one or two of the stories and w what emerged as a thesis um, uh, for the book, and then I thought to make it more interesting for you, because if you want to read the book, you can read the book and find out what I have to say there anyhow, uh, is to explain to you how the world of organized crime um, has been adapting and responding to the financial crisis since September of last year, and I'll give away the bottom line, is they have been uh, adapting and responding with... Uh, uh, great efficiency and uh, with um, a lot of imagination. And it is one of the few uh, global sectors which is actually thriving as a consequence of what happened last September. But I, I'll start by explaining why I decided to write this book. It was almost six years to the day, about six years and two weeks ago, that Zoran Djindic, the Prime Minister of Serbia, was assassinated on the steps of the federal, federal government building in Belgrade. Now, the <clears throat> usual explanation for Djindic's murder is that uh, uh, he was uh, being too tough on war criminals. Um, he was being tough on war criminals. But the real explanation, in my opinion, is, is that three months prior to his death, he had passed the first ever witness protection program brought it into law uh, in southeastern Europe. Not only had he introduced a witness protection program, but he had persuaded the bosses, or the boss, of uh, one of the biggest organized crime syndicates in Belgrade to come and testify uh, against some of his counterparts in the organized crime world. And indeed, um, the uh, people who were ev eventually convicted uh, of Jinjic's murder um, were part of one of those organized crime syndicates, the so-called Zemun clan, as well as being um, involved in paramilitary activity uh, throughout the Yugoslav wars. Uh, and Jinjic, full disclosure here, was a friend of mine and had been for 13 or 15 years or so prior to his uh, murder. And so I wanted, for two reasons, to try and understand why we had come to that point um, after the great moment of 1989. Um, 1989 was a fantastic year for me because uh, I had, in the decade or so prior to 1989, been involved in organizations that were supporting opposition groups uh, in Eastern Europe, like Solidarity and Charter 77, the democratic opposition in Hungary. And I had actually been involved myself in uh, smuggling books and dismembered Xerox machines into Eastern Europe. So I knew all about smuggling and crime, uh, which was handy when I came to write McMafia. Um, 
And, uh, <clears throat> of course, by the time I, uh, 1989 happened, I'd, I was working for the BBC, and so I'd, I'd jettisoned uh, all my political commitment of previous years, and I was there just objectively reporting on what was going on. Um, but it really was this fantastic moment when 250 million people were at last granted or, or could see the opportunity for democratic rights, which they had been systematically denied uh, for so long. Um, but very few of us had anticipated uh, 1989, and few of us had thought about what would happen after 1989, including, for example, the German government, who the uh, German Interior Ministry, its so-called German-German section, which looked at relations with East Germany, uh, a year before 1989 had put out a report confidently predicting that the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe would last at least another 20 years. So there was very little intelligence going on about what would happen if. And of course, our, our assumption was in 1989 that uh, uh, Eastern Europe was peopled by millions and millions of Václav Havels. Um, <laughs> this turned out to be not the case, unfortunately. And none of us really knew uh, what to expect. Um, there was a rush of democratic sentiment throughout the region. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the consequences of this rush of democratic sentiment uh, was, of course, to address the abuses um, perpetrated by the security forces over the, over the previous period. And in some countries, like Bulgaria, for example, they did this <coughs> by sacking large numbers of members of the security forces. Indeed, Bulgaria in 1989, um, between 1989 and 1991, let go of 14,000 members uh, of the security forces, 14,000 members. And yet, in 1989, it wasn't just communism that had collapsed, it was the state that had collapsed as well. The state didn't have the capacity to police uh, society, it certainly didn't have a legal system to deal with the emergence of contract law and capitalism in the entire uh, region. Um, <clears throat> and so it was a very unstable period indeed. Now, when your state is collapsing and your economy is heading south at a rate of knots, the last thing you want coming onto your job market is 14,000 people whose chief skills are building underground networks, um, smuggling, um, and killing people. Um, but that is what happened in Bulgaria. And because these people were no longer being afforded the privileges that the communist state had afforded them, they hooked up with a num another group of society that had uh, also lost their privileged position. And that was, believe it or not, um, the uh, sportsmen of uh, the Soviet period, in particular bodybuilders uh, and wrestlers, who you may remember from before 1989 would always win the uh, Olympic Games gold medals, uh, in these disciplines. And what happened uh, throughout the region in this early period is, is that these people literally seized power. They became the privatized law enforcement agencies that were regulating society from Slovenia right over to the Chinese, uh, Chinese border. Um, and this really was very dramatic in places like Bulgaria where the byword for organized crime was not the mafia, but it was the wrestlers.